Amen. Revelation chapter 1. I'm going to go ahead and read verses 1 through 3. And I'll give you some thoughts. This is an introduction to the book. Amen. I'm going to give you some thoughts. And then we'll dive into Revelation 1, 1. Amen. Very important. So let's start by reading. Verse 1 says, The revelation of Jesus Christ. Well, we know where it gets its name now, don't we? He says, Which God gave unto Him to show unto His servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. We're a lot of stuff to talk about there. Amen. And we're not going to talk about most of it today because it's just too much to talk about. But I want to tell you that this book was written, believed, around 90 A.D. This was after John the Beloved had been dipped in boiling oil and pulled out immediately um, so that his skin would break down and he would suffer a slow death from disease. And they put him, uh, banished him out on the Isle of Patmos where he was to suffer slowly. But what's interesting, though there's persecution against the kingdom of heaven, there's a God of grace that took care of John. And John's sitting there in all that misery and everything, doesn't complain once, and he gives us the revelation of Jesus Christ. Don't tell me that there's something that we go through that God ain't got it covered. Amen? So that's who it was written by. This man was very close to the Lord Jesus during the Lord's earthly ministry. It's the one that was always next to him at the table. He's the one that that had some things revealed to him that the others didn't. They were very close. Amen. So John, uh, he's the beloved is what they call him. And here he, when, when he gives us a witness every time from the book of John or his three epistles, uh, first, second, and third John, and now Revelation, the four books that he's written under inspiration, every one of them, is a close, intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Every one of them. That's what I want, don't you? So we see a little bit about the man here. I'm going to tell you this, and we're going to say it over and over again. This book was written to the churches. When we read verses 4 through 20, uh, we're going to see, and I'm going to have to break that down, but it was written to the churches in Asia. There were seven churches in Asia. That's who it's written to. Amen. People say, well, no, this is the ages of the church, blah, blah, blah. You know, those people that say that, they always include the Catholics as part of the church. Isn't that interesting? And listen, that's, that's garbage. Just like the day age theory, just like evolution, it's garbage. And it's universal church to try to say, well, each one of these churches is a representation of an era. Amen. No, it's not. It's an actual church that had actual pastors and members. Amen. And they had actual problems and they had actual blessings and they had actual rebukes. Amen. And those seven churches are seven examples for us today of what to be and not to be. Amen. I thank God he's given us a one stop shop in Revelation two and three and told us what to be and what not to be as a church. Isn't that right? Amen. It's written to the churches. You can like it or lump it. It's the truth. Take your Thice, take your uh, um, Schofield, take your Wearsby, you take, uh, what's his name, Dwight Pentecost, you take that garbage and you flush it. Amen. It's written, this isn't a general epistle. It was written to the churches of Asia and he names all seven of them. Amen? So please understand that. This was written to the churches. That means we as a church are to take attendance to this epistle. This is a letter to us. Amen? And then uh, I'm going to give you the scope of the book. And uh, I guess I have to follow what some others use because I, they're right. But in verse 19, he says, Write these things which thou hast seen and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. I don't know of a better way to divide the book of Revelation 
than that thing right there. However, I promise you, as we get learning this and we use this skeleton outline that God has given us, we will not uh, interpret it the same way that the pre-tribbers interpret it. We will not. Amen. We're going to see that in the book of Revelation, you don't have seven seals. Okay, they complete. Then seven trumpets. Okay, they complete. And then seven vials of wrath. That's the way they interpret it. It is confusing. It leaves people scratching their head. Maybe it makes for good movies, but it's horrible for doctrine and theology. Amen. So even though I'm using this this obvious verse to help us divide up Revelation, I'm not going to divide it like the uh, dispensationalists. I reject dispensationalism 100%. Amen. Not 99%. 100. Amen. So I'm supposed to be teaching this. Sorry, I'm getting a little excited. All right. Let's go to uh, verse one here. I mean, we got to understand that this is written to churches. I mean, the last chapter says the spirit and the bride say come. Who's the bride of Christ? The church of Jesus Christ. Amen. And it ain't this universal, mysterious thing. If you believe that and you've been around here, you're sleeping through every message. Amen. You you just slept for weeks while we taught on the locality of the church. Amen. Uh, but anyway, that's why we have YouTube. You can just click back on there and learn some things. All right. The revelation of Jesus Christ, verse 1. I like how that starts. I'm going to tell you, before we look at this, the day I enjoy most in my life was the day that I was, that Jesus Christ revealed Himself to me. Amen. We're going to be preaching this morning a little bit on that and how I got to know Jesus and how He got to know me. We're going to talk about that in the message. It's not the title of the message but or the main theme, but but we're going to talk about that. Do you remember the day that Jesus came in? Do you remember how awestruck you were over your sin and how ungodly you realized you were and you needed a Savior because you were in a hopeless, helpless condition? See, everybody thinks Jesus comes like real soft. Oh, believe in me. Please believe in me. Oh, please, see my scarred hands. I'll carry you as my sheep. Believe in me. That's a bunch of stuff you'll find on pictures at Hobby Lobby. But the Bible teaches that when Jesus comes, He stirs you up. Matter of fact, He'll probably make you angry. Isn't that right? He will shake you up. I asked them folks last night, why are you so angry at our street preaching? Well, because you're yelling out on the corner. I said, you know that ain't it. That's what they do at the rock concert. You're upset because you know I'm right. That's why you're upset. Because you know I'm right. See, what's happening is Jesus Christ is introducing Himself to them and boy, they don't like it. And I didn't like it either. But I thank God that I got to a place where I finally realized, man, that preacher's right and he's right about me and I need Jesus. Amen. The revelation of Jesus Christ. And by the way, I revel in it. Amen. Just put the words all together. That's not even an outline. I guess I'm just in rare form this morning. <laughs> All right, the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is talking about His program. This is, this is, the, the main theme is His second coming, but it's talking about His program on planet earth through the church. Come on, get a hold of that, because it's things which were and which are and which are to come. That book is not written about the things that are to come only. It's written about the things that are, friends. Amen? God is using His church. There's a program on planet earth and God is revealing it to us through not only the epistles, but also through the book of Revelation. Amen? And He's making it clear to us. Now, uh, let's look though just for a second talking about the revelation of Jesus Christ as it concerns His second coming. Now, I want you to know that the Bible teaches that there's only a first coming of Jesus Christ and a second coming of Jesus Christ. There are no more. Matter of fact, we don't have to say the second coming. We can say the last coming. Amen? He's first and last. He had a first coming, and now He's going to have a last coming. Amen? No problem with that. And I want to tell you this whole idea of Him appearing up in the clouds somewhere, no one seeing Him, and all of a sudden, all these people like, you know, 
bloop, bloop, all get raptured up, and then he goes back to heaven. That yo-yo rapture theme that they're talking about is not in the Bible. It's assumed, and it's uh, Protestant doctrine. That's not biblical doctrine. Amen? Listen, let me give you some things about this. The revelation of Jesus Christ talking about His second coming. Let me read to you, and you can turn there if you want, but I'm going to kind of take off ahead, okay? Acts 1, verses 9-11 through 11 says, And when He had spoken these things... Now what? Now listen to me now. While they beheld... Okay, there's His church on, on the hill, and they're watching Him. It says, He was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. It didn't say he disappeared, did it? It said he was taken up. And then he went into a cloud and they couldn't see him anymore. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? Now listen to me, folks, before I read the rest of this. These men were standing there beholding as Jesus Christ, when His body physically went up in their presence and they were watching Him go up. And He disappeared in the clouds. Listen to what the angel said. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen Him go into heaven. In other words, He's going to come with clouds and we're going to see Him come out of the clouds. It's like a reverse. Amen? You see what the Bible says? Now where's the rapture in that? It's nowhere there. Look with me over at Revelation 6 and verses 15 through 17. Now this right here is the end of the sixth seal. I cannot comment on that right now, so please forget anything except what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to be a fundamentalist just for a second and ask you to believe what I'm saying and forget everything else around it. Amen? All right, that's a joke, okay? Verse 15, And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Listen, folks, that's the revelation of Jesus Christ right there. The whole world is going to see his glory during those judgments. Now, I believe it's going to be a one big campaign. I don't believe it's going to be like, and everything happens. I believe He's going to form His armies. I believe the Antichrist is going to form His. I believe the whole world is going to hate these judgments. And I believe those of us who are still alive that are in Christ will know those judgments and have the grace of God to stand in truth. And we're going to see a war like no other. Amen? But the point is, the coming of Christ is never mentioned as invisible. Never. It's always visible. So we see His his last coming. So when this book says the revelation of Jesus Christ, it's talking about His second coming. But let me tell you what else it's talking about. It's talking about His resurrected glory. Go back to chapter 1 and look at verse 12. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Now we're going to comment on all this when we get to it. Amen. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. This is the resurrected Jesus Christ that's going to be revealed to us in this book. Amen. If we got nothing else out of this book, Except the glory of the resurrected Lord, I want to tell you, it'd make you want to live for Him and it'd make you beg for His return. Amen? Alright, moving on. We see in verse 1, when it says the revelation of Jesus Christ, 
It's talking about His second coming. Number two, it's talking about His resurrected glory. But number three, it's talking about His predetermined purpose. He has a purpose through the church and, and into the end times. Amen? Boy, don't you love the day we're in where the church is just blown off like it doesn't matter? Well, we just go where Ma and them go. Well, I was raised a Methodist, so I guess that's what I'll be. People want to just blow it off. Independent Baptists are the worst. I said, where do you go to church? Well, we go to church. They're pretty good over here. Such and such fundamental Baptist church. Of course, they celebrate Christmas and Easter and Valentine's and they're pre-trib. And I mean, what else do you need? Get out. Amen. What else do you need? Well, they're 501c3, but it's the best we can find. Hey, listen, when you say that, suck on your thumb to go with it, okay? But it's the best we can find. I'm not trying to be funny. I'm trying to be realistic here. I've had to drive to church. Okay, hours. I've had to drive to church. Uh, I had to go drive 13 hours to get baptized. Amen. I'm just talking about you follow God. Amen. He has a predetermined purpose. Look at chapter 5 and verse 6. Are you all being introduced pretty good so far? I hope it's a blessing to you. He says, And I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Now we're gonna, we're gonna comment on that. Okay? But I have, I can't just read that and move on. I gotta tell you, it said this seven, uh, horns, seven eyes, and it said the seven spirits there, right? are sent forth into all the earth. Now let me ask you a question. What has God used or whom has God used to send forth into all the earth? Somebody help me out. The church, amen. The church is the temple of God, 1 Corinthians 3, 2 Corinthians 6, Ephesians chapter 1 and 2. It is the house of God. He has sent His church. That's why He said, now get this, it's going to match. Ready? Go ye therefore. <laughs> Go who therefore? Go the church therefore. He was talking to his church. Right. Amen. Go ye. He looked right at them. He didn't look around and go, Hey, all y'all that saved. Go. No, he looked right at his church. Right. You. You go. That's the one that carries the Spirit of God into right. all the earth. Amen. Are you hearing it today? Are y'all ready for revelation? I'm going to tell you. If this one bored you, then we'll study something else because and I'll probably resign because this has got me just stirred up. Amen. I've never seen revelation like I have the last year studying and picking away at it and going over it and over it and over it. And then God through prayer and through fasting and much study showing you little places in scripture that match. They're just popping up all everywhere. And I haven't had to come up here to the church and grab one of my old Protestant commentaries that I use uh, for informational purposes. Hadn't had to do any of that. God has revealed it, and that's the way it's supposed to be. He's going to reveal this through His church like He always has. Amen? All right. The revel I don't think we're going to get past this phrase, okay? The revelation of Jesus Christ. Number one, it's talking about uh, His second coming. Number two... It's talking about His resurrected glory. We're be, we're, it's being revealed to us. Number three, His predetermined purpose. Let me give you one more verse on that just to strengthen you. Look at chapter 13 and verse 8. He says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship Him. <laughs> That's His predetermined purpose. Philippians 2 tells us that every knee shall bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And it says that things in heaven, things on earth, and things under the earth or below or beneath the earth, that means hell, everything that hath breath is going to give praise to Jesus Christ. That's a revelation here for us. We're going to see that predetermined purpose. Amen? Also, he goes in there and he says, um, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation 
of the world. He's revealing to us specifically what happens to the saved and what happens to the lost. This is a book that needs our attention. Amen? And then fourthly, His protracted purpose. Not only His predetermined purpose, but His protracted purpose. Do you know what His protracted purpose is? It is to rule physically on earth. That, that's one. That's the whole purpose. You see, uh, man used to be the head of this thing called the earth. And a man flushed it down the commode for us. Amen? And by the way, any one of you would have done the same. God knew, God knew that if you give a finite person infinite responsibilities, at some point, the finite cannot match it. When He said you're a man, he, God created him. He's a created being. He is a sub-being from God. Now, God cannot create Himself. Isn't that correct? Because if He could, then that means that God would be a created being. Are you following me? Alright, so God is infinite and He creates man. So when He created man, man cannot be infinite. He can't. Even if He's perfectly innocent, He cannot be infinite. He does not see the end from the beginning. He's not the same as God. He's not omniscient. All-knowing, all-powerful. You understand? And then God gives the man who he loves and wants to fellowship with, he gives him something he never gave to anybody else. And that is the choice of reason to choose right and wrong so that he could choose to walk with God or not. Now here's the issue. Your children are a product of you. Now, we can't really use this as a just comparison comparison, because really, uh, in your being, we're all equals, right? However, in their infancy, can they see the end from the beginning? No. They can't even find their thumb to suck, right? Uh, can, they, can you trust them at age four to cross the street? No. You have to say, don't cross the street. You have to guard that, amen? But God gave to Adam. He said, do anything you want. Just don't eat of that tree. There was only one law. God knew He would break it. And He did. He didn't see the end from the beginning, at least in full scope. But He did know He was going to die and He died for His wife. He did know that. And He died for His wife. And I believe any man that wouldn't do that is not a man. So anyway, Adam gives up man's rule on earth. He gives it up. It's turned over to the God of this world. His name is Satan. Formerly Lucifer. But Jesus Christ became a man. Hear me? He became a man. God became a man. Why? To win back that which was lost. And a man will rule again. A man who is infinite. A man who is omniscient. A man who cannot sin. He is going to rule on this earth. Hallelujah for that. Amen. I thank God that Jesus Christ won back the favor of God or we'd all be miserable and on our way to hell. Amen? Amen. So, his protracted purpose. Remember, what we're looking at is this phrase, the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's being revealed to us. It's His second coming. It's His resurrected glory. It's His predetermined purpose. It's His protracted purpose. Listen, not only in His protracted purpose is He going to reveal to us His rule on earth, but He's going to reveal to us how He's going to destroy Satan and all His seed. I like that revelation. Amen. By the way, the only way you can destroy Satan is by Jesus Christ. That's not a new revelation there, is it? Amen? 
His protracted purpose to rule on earth, to destroy the devil and all of his seed, to deliver the redeemed kingdom to his Father, wherein a new heaven and earth will be established with a new Jerusalem where we will live with the Lamb for all eternity, where the river of life flows from His throne and the tree of life is there and all the saved of the nations walk in the light of it and the, tr- the leaves of the tree of life are there for their healing. These things you've all heard before. When we read that phrase, the revelation of Jesus Christ, that's what we're going to see. Amen. Now let me give you the next phrase and we'll just move on. And we'll stop there today. It says, which God gave unto him. That's interesting. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. When was the revelation of Jesus Christ established? Was it established in A.D. 90 as we see it unfold? No, my friends. It was established from the foundation of the world. That's why we're going to read about the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Listen to me about the love of God, folks. God so loved us and loved man, knowing He would fail, already had the plan in place that would not only pay for man and purchase man, but give man the ability to have the eternal Spirit of God living in him where he'd never be able to fall again. It was predetermined, ladies and gentlemen. It was already set forth. Listen to these wonderful verses. We love Hebrews 12.2 when it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Aren't you glad He finished it? It's a done deal. Amen. These Catholics have Him hanging on a cross. I'm going to tell you what. He finished it. He's not still on that cross. Anyway, the author and finisher of our faith. Now watch this. Who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. People will take that verse and say, who for the joy that was set before Him. And I don't know about you, but every sermon just about I've ever heard preached, this fundamentalist, because that's the only kind of churches I went to before I got right with God, this fundamentalist will always bring that home to soul winning. Every time, and he's going to try to steal your emotions by saying, oh, you can know that he saw the joy on his face of of seeing old Abraham saved and seeing your grandma come up and and you getting to see grandma in heaven and have y'all heard them sermons? You have? Okay. I know you've heard them. If you've been a fundamentalist for 15 seconds, you've heard them sermons. Most of their sermons are about coon dogs crossing creeks and granny's biscuits. Am I right? There's no doctrine. I don't get excited about that. I don't get excited about Grandma. I think more about the excitement I had going to see her house when she'd always give me free food. I'm serious. Sammy, have you eaten? Uh Uh-uh. Lie like a dog. Obviously, my mom fed me. Amen. (laughs) Uh Uh-uh. She'd start feeding me. That was great. That was wonderful. It's not about seeing Grandma in heaven. It's about seeing Jesus. It's about the revelation of Jesus. So what is this verse talking about? What is he saying when he says, who for the joy that was set before him? What joy was set before Jesus? I'll tell you what joy was set before him. The joy of resurrecting from the grave after having finished uh, uh, dying our sins and leading captivity captive and bringing them all up with the blood. And that's probably where victory in Jesus was written. Amen, if you know what I mean. And He got up there and that blood was brought to the uh, 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 mercy seat of God in heaven. And it was sprinkled and thrown in heaven on all the objects in heaven. And He looks at God and it's an acceptable sacrifice. And His Father has this big grin on His face. And He says, well, glory! This is my Son, and today I have begotten Thee. Amen? That's the joy Jesus received. Let me give you another verse. 
Psalm 1611, he says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. We sing that, don't we? At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Turn with me to Acts chapter 2. We'll read this and close. Acts chapter 2. And I want you to look at verse 25. For David speaketh concerning him. Now, he's about to quote Psalm 16, which is what I just gave you. He says, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for He is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt Thou suffer Thine Holy One to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life, Thou shalt, now watch, make me full of joy with thy countenance. (laughs) Now that's good stuff. That's Bible right there, isn't it? Jesus, the joy that was set before Him. That, this revelation, all this book that we're about to study, along with the other 65 books of the Bible, was already a done deal in Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the God I worship. All right, I'm going to stop there. Uh, Man, I've only gone 30 minutes. I should go ahead. Never mind. We started a little late. It's okay. Let me stop here.